So again, thank you so much. Um, we're honored to be with you. Um, so briefly, PBGH is celebrating 40 years of service to the region by helping protecting the ability of employers to provide high quality, affordable, and equitable health care to its employees and their families. Our work has been recognized nationally from award-winning group purchasing programs to thought leadership on the critical and essential issues facing employers every day. Um, we are part of the National Alliance of Healthcare Purchaser Coalitions and work with similar groups from across the country to advocate, educate, and empower employees around healthcare and benefits. Um, as part of our commitment, we made the decision to deliberately focus on business units that comprise the PBGH mission. And we are now rolling out branded parts of our commitment, including group purchasing solutions, um, which houses our major initiatives designed to help save employers money and drive high value for both organizations and their employees. Next is the Health and Business Institute, which frames out and delivers comprehensive education, networking, and peer-to-peer -peer efforts, such as webinars, forums, our annual symposium, among others. Um, that is followed by Bridges for Health Equity, which aims to bridge the gap on systemic racism facing so much of our community um, with various programs, outreach, initiatives, and partnerships. Lastly, in 2020, we launched our It's All Your Business podcast to provide a voice for and among employers about healthcare and benefits topics and solutions. Um, this is my brief introduction about PBGH. And without further ado, please join me in welcoming to the virtual stage, Claire Hunter. Thanks, Malcolm. Thanks, Liz. Good morning, everybody. It's nice to be here with you. Um, I know this is a topic that everybody is uh, a bit bombarded with, probably, to be honest, with you know, COVID information on the news and our day-to-day -day updates and webinars. So Dr. Kusi and I have presented some material that we hope is beneficial to really capture, you know, what's happened in the last 30 days in the COVID-19 vaccine space and give you some consideration that we're seeing in the market for our clients and customers around uh, employer strategies for back to work and encouraging best practices amongst your employees to promote vaccines. As Liz mentioned, um, one of the areas we're really going to focus on today is a comparison of the vaccines that are available in the U.S. Again, all of this content will be specific to the United States. As many of you probably know, um, every country is handling this rollout distribution a little bit differently in, in terms of how they're evaluating the products that are available, how they're authorizing, distributing, and which formulations are available. But in the US, this is a, a recent change. Many of you may be aware of some of the labeling changes around the Johnson and Johnson vaccine, which we'll certainly get into, but there are currently three formulations approved by three different manufacturers in the US. Um, the first that was approved was the Moderna vaccine back in December of 2020. Shortly thereafter, followed by Pfizer, again in December of 2020, and most recently in February of this year, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Um, the CDC and FDA does not differentiate between recommending one product in certain populations over the other. Guidance as it stands today is that uh, the FDA is recommending individuals obtain their first available formulation. So there's no differences in labeling for necessarily who is eligible with the exception of age. Um, you'll see on our comparison chart here, um, one of the big differences is that the Pfizer vaccine is indicated right now for individuals down to the age of 16, whereas Moderna and Johnson & Johnson are indicated for only uh, adult patients over the age of 18 at this time. There are several pediatric studies being um, evaluated and ongoing to determine if that age bracket for any of the vaccines will be lowered. Uh, most notably, Pfizer, I, I think, will be the first that will have some labeling changes brought to market. But again, as it stands today, depending on the formulation, either age of 16 or 18. The other notable difference is the dosing schedule or regimen for the vaccine, and they all vary slightly. So the Pfizer vaccine is a two-dose series administered 21 days or three weeks apart. The Moderna vaccine is another two-dose series administered 28 days apart or about a month. 
and the Johnson and Johnson vaccine is a one dose vaccine to complete the series. There is some flexibility within those ranges um, for individuals who are perhaps traveling or can't get an appointment down to the, the day requirement of either the 21 or 28 days. So there is some flexibility, uh, plus or minus, typically a week or two weeks before or after those ranges. Um, so they don't, again, have to be held to the day. Um, something interesting to note is that many other countries are evaluating right now whether or not the second dose administration for both the Pfizer and Moderna should be extended, particularly in individuals who've had a positive COVID diagnosis in the past. So there's some um, evaluation right now of whether that, that dosing regimen will stand, but it's firm at the moment, um, at least in the United States, to capture the most immunity and, and potency. Um, there are several formulations that are also in the pipeline for review. Uh, that are slated to be reviewed by the FDA over the next several months. So most notably AstraZeneca and Novavax have formulations that are in what we, what we consider the near-term pipeline. So we may have up to five vaccines uh, in the near future here. <clears throat> Many of you are probably aware Johnson & Johnson took some recent uh, warning considerations and labeling changes. So it would be remiss if we didn't talk about that today. Um, on April 13th, the Advisory Committee of Immunization Practices, or ACIP, that's kind of the subgroup committee within the FDA that dictates all approvals, regulations, and guidance on immunizations, not specific to COVID, but all vaccine practices. They decided to hold distribution and administration of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine due to some alarming data that had come in around uh, adverse events. They determined that there were 15 cases nationwide of uh, a syndrome called TTS or thrombocytopenia syndrome, which is essentially a, a situation of a serious blood clot. And 13 of the 15 individuals were women under the age of 50. So upon further review, the FDA and this committee took some time to dig into all the adverse event reporting, the specifics of those cases, and a comprehensive evaluation to determine that the Johnson & Johnson vaccine is now back on the market. It has, has been deemed um, that it con continues to be safe. However, there is a warning, particularly for women under the age of 50, for a very, very rare risk of this syndrome occurrence. So again, at this time, all three vaccines are back on the market uh, with, with the full support of both the FDA and CDC. And they are not differentiating again between administration of one dose versus the other, one manufacturer versus the other at this time. Uh, we wanna spend a little time talking about eligibility requirements. And of course, prior to the second quarter of this year, this has really, really been a state-by-state -state kind of phase-wise uh, approach Many states have taken what we're calling a tiered eligibility approach to say they're handling the rollout due to uh, limited availability and dosing at the time of the initial rollout to try and triage the most at-risk populations or individuals. So this has actually recently changed as of April 19th. The Biden administration recommended that uh, COVID eligibility open to all U.S. adults. And this was a, a gentle recommendation to states, but most states have followed suit. So now that eligibility is essentially open to individuals either down to the age of 16 for the Pfizer, or again, over the age of 18 for Moderna and Johnson & Johnson to make sure that all adults have access if appropriate. Just something to keep in mind, and I think a good tip and best practice for employer, um, many, many states, if not all, have hotlines scheduling resources. So if you have any individuals covered under your health plan that are having difficulties getting an appointment, whether that's due to lack of technology, many of these appointments are being booked online, um, inability to find an appointment. There are many free resources that, that individuals can get connected with to make sure that they have access to an appointment at their earliest convenience. Wanted to just take a minute and do a, a quick refresh on what is the state of the state across the country, if you will, for vaccine administration to date. So sharing some data 
that's published by the CDC. This is refreshed on an almost daily basis. This data is actually current through the weekend. And you can see here, um, they're reporting regularly and updating data in terms of how many doses are delivered, meaning they've been shipped to a hospital, pharmacy, distribution facility. Uh, we're at over 290 million doses have been delivered at this point in time. 228 million of those doses have actually been administered and gone in someone's arm. And then some interesting breakouts on who's receiving these vaccinations, who's received at least one dose, and who is considered fully vaccinated. So fully vaccinated means for the Johnson & Johnson, it's completion of the one dose, and Pfizer and Moderna, again, it's completion of that two-part series. So across the U.S., we have about 42% of the population receiving at least one dose at this point in time, and just under a third are considered fully vaccinated. There is um, some breakdowns that you can see here by age. We're looking at about half of the population in adults receiving at least one dose at this time. And if we look into older populations, specifically over the age of 65, um, their rates are much higher. Again, in many states, they were considered part of that um, high risk category or rollout. So many of them had preferential scheduling or um, earlier eligibility to be able to receive a dose. Another interesting look, um, the CDC again publishes this information on a daily basis. Uh, they're looking at administration rates by state. And again, this is just informational as most states have varied in their rollouts and, and overall in their handling of COVID and safety practices since the start of the pandemic. But you can see here, this is a heat map across the country determining doses per 100,000. And the, the light teal options are on the lower end of the spectrum for dosing administration. Upwards of the, the dark blue and navy blue are the states that have the highest dosage administration per 100,000. So you can see here Pennsylvania and surrounding states are kind of in the middle and, and closer to the higher end of the spectrum in that 70,000 70, to 75,000, which is certainly promising. And we're seeing this change, of course, every single day as more and more doses become available and regulations are changing. Um, last on nationwide stats, wanted to share with you um, a just breakdown. Again, the, the CDC has not dictated any sort of preferential or guidance on preferring one formulation versus another, but um, I think that the breakdown of who's receiving which vaccination, vaccination has really been determined by access. So this is a breakdown of doses administered and fully vaccinated individuals across the U.S. by manufacturer. So Pfizer is certainly in the lead here, if you will, with over 120 million doses administered, followed closely by Moderna, and lastly, Johnson & Johnson, which is no surprise due to, um, you know, Pfizer and Moderna both having many more months on the market, and as well as Johnson & Johnson um, coming later in February and again, having a bit of a delay for the data review. For any of your employees or individuals covered in the workplace that are concerned about getting vaccination, there are a wealth of resources available free from both the CDC and FDA on best practices, tips to ensure um, for a successful immunization. So for each of the formulations, um, a lot of the discussion really is around potential adverse effects. And as with any vaccination, um, the overall goal of the vaccine is to elicit an immune response to your body. So your body is essentially working up an immunity and, and your immune system is working to develop a protection against a future exposure of whatever the um, antigen is, in this case, COVID-19. But the majority of vaccines do have potential side effect warnings for things like injection, injection site irritation, so pain, redness, soreness. Um, all three doses or formulations at this time are administered in a um, intramuscular injection into the arm, into the deltoid. So that can certainly cause um, some potential pain or irritation at the site. That's the most common side effect. Um, in the clinical trials, as well as in our real world evidence, some individuals are experiencing, again, those, those generalized immune reactions, things like fatigue, chills, fever. Um, 
some best practices, again, that are being recommended are drinking plenty of fluids, uh, dress lightly when individuals are going to actually receive their vaccination. Again, it's going in the arm, so have one arm uh, be able to be exposed for easy administration. You can certainly apply a cool, wet compress over the injection site for individuals who may have that soreness or injection site reaction. And uh, contrary to, I think, popular belief, it's actually recommended to use that muscle or use that arm um, and keep it active, you know, immediately following the days following to prevent any sort of soreness. Um, during the actual administration itself, you can re recommend to folks that your arm and muscle should be as relaxed as possible, again, just to minimize any of these potential side effects. All side effects are generally very, very um, short-lived, less than 24 hours within the administration time and site, and do resolve on their own. Um, some providers are recommending for individuals who have fever or any sort of chills that Tylenol or ibuprofen may be used as needed, if that's appropriate with any sort of comorbid conditions that an individual may have. Lots of discussion happening across the country right now on what are employers' responsibilities, rights, and options around either mandating um, compliance with CDC and FDA guidance on vaccine administration, as well as complying with state-by-state -state protocols on masks, testing, and screening. So this information, as you all know, is changing. It feels like on a daily basis, but some of the most common employer strategies that we're seeing are um, varied, to say the least. Again, it depends on the state that the individuals reside in and their specific guidance, but many, many employers are, are dabbling around the ideas of vaccine mandates, which the EEOC has put out recent guidance around this and is certainly permissible by law to mandate vaccine documentation to enter a building or comply with work requirements. Again, caveating, as with most EEOC regulations, there are exceptions and um, scenarios that would have to be considered a reasonable accommodation. Something to keep in mind and has been changing uh, quite frequently is that many states are offering um, and or requiring paid time off for administration of the vaccine. So at this point in time, I don't believe that Pennsylvania is a state that is requiring paid time off for vaccine administration, but many states are. And again, something to consider if you have employees uh, eligible in potentially other states. So many states are offering paid time off for up to a period of so many hours to allow for time off work to drive to an appointment, actual administration, and potentially um, some downtime to rest after that vaccine. So something to consider. Even if your state does not require that, many employers are, are offering that as an enhanced benefit to their employees to make sure that they're a, encouraging and promoting best practices in immunization administration, but also not deterring any individuals from obtaining a vaccine if they're eligible. Uh, another common strategy that we're seeing is other forms of incentivization. So that can be um, increases in PTO pools or allotments you know, outside of the vaccine administration, um, additional benefits, gift cards, you know, certainly financial incentives and, and some of those tangible opportunities to, again, increase compliance with the overall national guidelines. So, Dr. Kusti, I'm going to turn it over to you at this time to talk a little bit about common myths. We know that there are many, many out there, uh, many of which have been you know, dispelled by the medical literature or not supported, certainly, by the medical literature. So, this is an area that we're finding more and more employers spending a lot of their time um, having conversations with employees and guiding employees to good resources that are have credible information that they can rely on and trust to make sure that your employees and your members have accurate, truthful, uh, and meaningful information so that they can make the best informed healthcare decision that's right based on their personal risk factors, situations, and comorbidities. Thank you, Claire. Uh, greetings, everybody, and thank you for having us this morning. 
So I wanted to start with uh, talking a little bit about some of the misinformation or myths or rumors that are circulating. Some I received from different employers um, as part of surveys that are questions that are being submitted, some through my searching uh, on the web, and some is just, uh, you know, in the community, people just asking these questions. But, you know, in general, um, vaccines are considered the best tool that we have from a public health perspective and preventive medicine to end an outbreak or a pandemic. Uh, if, if we are, um, you know, I'm sure like everybody else, if we want to have a, a day that we can announce this pandemic is over, the, vac the vaccination is the way to get there. Um, you know, a lot of effort, a lot of companies have uh, worked together. And as, as Claire mentioned, in the US, we have three um, vaccinations right now that are authorized under the EUA. And, you know, while it seems like this pandemic has journey has been really, really long for a lot of us, uh, we finally have the tool to end this. So I, I can finally see the light at the end of the tunnel. I hope everybody else is seeing that too. Uh, next slide, please. I wanted to talk a little bit about vaccine um, hesitancy in general. And as you can see, this was a survey done. This was pre-COVID. Uh, this was in 2019. A lot of it was targeted to uh, parents of children who are in the age of immunization. But um, you know, I found it very interesting because a lot of it did apply and we saw the exact same response with, when COVID-19 vaccines were being rolled out. So in this survey, um, roughly about 20% uh, believe that you know, vaccines cause uh, autism. This is, you know, particularly was associated with the MMR, the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine. Uh, this is despite that the fact that we had hundreds of studies that came out and disputed that fact. And even the study that published that, the authors themselves withdraw that study and, and withdraw their conclusion and admitted that it was not a correct conclusion and association. But regardless of all of that scientific data, people still believe in that. So this just tells you how strong one piece of misinformation can, can last and spread. And it, it's just like a poison that never goes away. About 15% uh, also believe that vaccines are full of toxins. Um, now, the the vaccines that uh, COVID-19 vaccines uh, are have the manufacturers have released all the contents of the vaccines, and you know at the, at, at the percentage and the, the the amounts they're using, none of them are considered toxic or harmful to humans. And in fact, a, a lot of the additives and the um, you know, con uh, the, the components of these vaccines are used in other day-to-day -day food products. Uh, about 20% inaccurately uh, thought that it makes no difference whether parents choose to delay or spread out vaccines despite regulation. Uh, now, this is also true for adults. Uh, while this study did not capture that, we do know that roughly 5 million um, adults in the U.S. currently chose or just did not get their second vaccine despite, uh, and this is for the, the two-dose vaccine, uh, this, the Moderna and the Pfizer, despite the fact that the regulation, the recommendation and, the, and the, all the guidelines clearly indicate that you needed the two doses uh, at this time, as, as Claire mentioned. But despite that, 5 million people just you know, for, for many reasons, they did not uh, opt to get the second shot. And about 20% uh, also believe that it is better to develop immunity by getting the disease than by uh, getting the vaccine. And obviously that is very dangerous because this is um, that movement that came out and people are talking about, hey, just let it open up everything and let everybody get infected. We'll get herd immunity that way. Um, to, to really get to that, uh, we would suffer, um, you know, millions to billions of lives of death, and that, that is obviously not acceptable. So that is a very dangerous thought process. The interesting part is that many, uh, <clears throat> many who reported that low trust in medical authorities also believed in vaccine misinformation, and then this 
belief in vaccine misinformation was true across all different demographics and political beliefs. So it wasn't to a certain region or, or area. It wasn't a certain political party. It was all over the scope. Next slide, please. So one of the common uh, myths that I hear is, hey, these vaccines were developed too quickly and were not tested. And I don't want to get I don't want to get it because I don't want to get I don't want to be the guinea pig or the test subject. Now, keep in mind that there was uh, significant resources that was pooled into developing these vaccines quickly. And this is not something that we see commonly. Usually manufacturers require a lot of time to gather resources, finances, investors to, to conduct these you know, clinical trials that you heard about. And it takes a lot of time to do that. And also you had all that, um, I guess, um, you know, company versus another company and, and everybody is holding to their secrets and, and everybody wants to come up with the latest and, and, and you know, most uh, recent uh, breakthrough. But with COVID-19, we did not see that. Actually, most vaccines were developed in collaboration between multiple agencies working together, which is kind of nice to see in, in medicine. I truly believe that if we do that more often, we can probably solve a lot of other medical problems that we're having. So, you know, this, um, this situation warranted this kind of uh, response. And I think we, you know, scientific community did a great job doing that. Now, also I wanted to mention that the tick, while it seems to be something uh, new to the public, this technology that they're using is really not new. I mean, this, they, for example, people are, or, and I'll talk a little bit more about this later, but the messenger RNA vaccines and the Pfizer and Moderna, um, these were used uh, about five, uh, almost over five years now. So it's not really new, it's new-ish uh, to the vaccine world and public health world, but it's not really new. It's, it's not like this is the first time we're using it in, in 2021. So this is not uh, a new technology at all. And in, in fact, uh, we have in the past uh, five to 10 years made significant breathtaking uh, ad medical advancement and scientific advancement. And we are getting better at making vaccines. Uh, for those who are like myself following you know, the vaccination world, you know, we're also in the process of developing a new malaria vaccine, which we didn't have a good one in the past. And hopefully many other diseases that we struggle with will have vaccination as we get more, uh, more advanced and better in creating vaccines. And for, the, for whatever next outbreak or pandemic, we would probably, we're probably gonna make the vaccines even faster and better. Um, next slide, please. So the, the side effects, uh, you know, myths that, uh, you know, people are thinking that, yeah, I'm going to have significant side effects. I mean, Claire did a really nice job talking about these um, side effects. We have several um, reports that came out from our uh, the CDC uh, Morbidity and Mortality Weekly reports, and these came out early on in January, but they looked at the potential reactions of our Pfizer. It was 11, roughly 11 per million. Uh, with 71% of those occurring in the first 15 minutes of, it, of vaccine administration. The Moderna had a 2.5 per million uh, people reporting uh, some sort of reaction. And th these reactions uh, ranged anywhere from just a little bit of pain and soreness at the site of injection to all the way uh, the list of the, the ones that um, Claire had showed, including fatigue, headaches, uh, fever, uh, and and so forth. So that really the, the studies, all the studies in the clinical trials are not indicating that there are severe, uh, commonly severe reactions to this vaccine. Next slide, please. And again, uh, we try to base our, um, our, our guidance on clinical evidence and you know, people think that more people will die as a result of a negative side effects to COVID vaccine that they would die from the virus. And obviously that's, you know, the studies and the science has not been proven to show that is true in any way, shape or form. Now the, the studies as uh, Claire in, indicated earlier did that, and these are particularly phase two and phase three clinical trials did show that people will have some short-term mild to moderate vaccine reactions. But again, these are uh, mild, they're short-lived, 
most the majority of people uh, will recover. Now, when we're looking on, on the scale of this vaccination and how we are looking at how we're monitoring these vaccine safety, you know, as if yesterday, about uh, 229 million people in the US received the vaccine and about 140 million received at least one dose with about 95 million being fully vaccinated. Worldwide, we have just above 1 billion person being vaccinated with you know the the number of people getting reactions or having side effects it's almost negligible when you look at it from a statistical standpoint it is roughly like a bunch of 0. 0.000005 something like that uh, and and these numbers are available and and anybody can look them up they're they're available in the public domain well when we look on the other hand this disease actually killed confirmedly killed 3.1 million people worldwide with over 550,000 people in the US and infected 32 million people in the US with um, an infection rate of uh, or number of 147 million people worldwide. Now, these are not just numbers. These are people. These are you know spouses, parents, um, offsprings, relatives, loved ones. These are real numbers. So the, 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 the impact of this disease is real. And again, this is the tool to stop all of this. You know, vaccines are not 100% effective. Like we don't have anything in medicine that I believe it's 100%. There's always a range and it differs from one person to another. But the benefit of getting the vaccine is far better and outweighs the risk of not getting vaccinated and potentially getting the disease. And even with people who are healthy and have perfect um, health, the benefit still outweighs the risk because this disease has shown us that it does not discriminate between uh, old, old or young and it, it will infect everybody and it will hit everybody really hard. Next slide, please. So one other uh, misinformation is that the vaccines may alter the DNA. And, and I find this myth very dangerous because for people who did not study cell biology and, and did not go through all that training, um, you know, they hear mRNA, DNA, it does sounds, you know, could be real, who knows? So hopefully, you know, me explaining this uh, will, will shed some light to that myth. But if you look at the cell here, um, in the middle, there's that uh, almost like a purple or dark blue sphere that's uh, labeled nucleus. And in that nucleus, which lives inside our cells, that's where the DNA live. And that's where our genetic materials are. And from a cell biology and physiology standpoint, RNAs cannot go into that. They cannot cross the nucleus membrane to go and alter the DNA. And usually substance that go and do that um, either trigger a automatic cell death or basically kills the cell. So it's not nothing, you know, really uh, is good when it goes and alter your, your um, genetic material. So it's really rare to have something that does that, that we are using in medicine. I mean, sometimes some chemotherapy and some specific gene targeted therapy may do that, but that's not, none of the vaccinations will, will do that. So, you know, the, these messenger RNA vaccine will basically work by instructing your cell on the outside, if you look at that whole um, mechanism or manufacturing uh, items in the, in the cytoplasm of the cell, which is the um, area surrounding or the outside of the nucleus, that's where your um, messenger RNA will go. They'll make this protein and they'll produce it out to the body to induce it, to trigger an immune response. So these, these vaccinations, um, all of them actually will not alter your DNA in any way, shape, or form. Next slide, please. So again, this, this is one I, I heard uh, come up more from time to time, and it's about the microchip or the nanotransducers that uh, are being injected in our arms, and it used to, you know, they're going to use it to track us. You know, these vaccines have been heavily uh, investigated and looked at by different uh, organizations and different independent committees around the world. And there's no evidence of any microchip or any high-tech nanotransducers uh, that are, um, you know, being injected. The vaccine will not track people or gather personal information into a database. 
uh, th there is a lot of, um, you know, when trying to trace this down where it came up from, it, there was a lot of um, stories, I guess, where this uh, myth originated, but one of them was the government wanted to track syringes so they can identify when somebody gets the vaccine, like that's a dose being administered and they can track how many doses are being administered. Uh, another one was uh, some high profile person uh, suggesting some kind of tracking mechanism. And it was about, again, trying to identify who uh, who is getting the vaccine and, and not. And, and a third one was they wanted to, people were talking about uh, the scientific community tracking uh, at various reactions. And we actually do have uh, multiple systems that monitor vaccine safety and allows people to report reactions immediately uh, if needed. And, and that's that's why we saw the hold on the pause on the Johnson Johnson vaccine, because those systems work and they're there to assure that if somebody develop any kind of reaction, uh, it is reported uh, uh, very quickly and it's investigated just to make sure again, that the vaccines are safe. Next slide, please. Uh, now, this is a common one, too, that I hear, uh, and it could be different things, but uh, I already had the COVID-19 vaccine and I recovered, so therefore I don't need to get vaccinated. Well, again, we don't have any scientific uh, data to firmly confirm how long after infection somebody is protected from getting COVID-19 vaccine, I mean, uh, infection. Uh, there were early suggestion, uh, early studies that suggested natural immunity that may last for 90 days. Other ones uh, were indicated roughly six months, but we still need more studies and more clinical trials to identify clearly how long after somebody gets infected, um, will they be safe from getting the, the virus uh, again? And therefore the current guidelines are still recommending that if you got, if you are an individual who um, you know, recovered from COVID-19, you would still need to get the COVID-19 vaccines. The only caveat is that if you are obviously symptomatic, actively symptom, having symptoms from COVID infection, you really need to wait until you recover from COVID-19. Um, if, you, if you are not symptomatic and you just tested positive, then you wait 14 days after that date of test, and then you can get the shot. And again, obviously, if you have COVID, uh, don't go out. You should be self-isolating. Don't go out and try to get the vaccine because you may infect the people uh, around you if you're doing that. And next slide, please. Um, this one is, is one of the reasons why we're probably seeing a, a sort of a fourth wave now. People who uh, got vaccinated are changing behavior and we are seeing this in Europe. We saw this in a lot of Asian countries and in the US. So people think that I don't need to wear a mask or follow any of the CDC guidelines in regards to physical distancing and, and you know, hand washing because I got vaccinated. You know, the first thing we need to know that it's still, you know, we, we still need time to have everybody get vaccinated, that we're not there yet. Um, we typically, in, in general, not with, not with COVID-19, but in general, when we talk about herd immunity, we need 75 to 85% of the community to be vaccinated. As you saw in the statistics, we're, we're about 50%, roughly 40, 42, uh, or about one third of the population in the US uh, have been vaccinated. So we're nowhere near that target yet. We still have a lot of work ahead of us. But we, and we also don't know exactly what is the percentage of uh, that is needed in the community for COVID-19 specifically. That's still being studied. And also while vaccines, you know, might prevent the person who, is, who got the vaccine from getting severely ill, uh, hospitalized, requiring ICU admission, mechanical ventilation, or saving you from death. And that's really the goal of the vaccine is to eliminate all of that severe illness and death. It's really not well studied um, how well the vaccine will prevent somebody who got vaccinated from um, transmitting the virus. We do know that it will lessen the risk uh, or lower the risk of transmission. However, we don't know if it eliminates the transmission um, completely. Therefore, somebody who got vaccinated could potentially transmit the virus to someone else who is not vaccinated and uh, potentially um, impact their life. So the current guidelines, until we have more data and more scientific evidence, still recommend that even if you're vaccinated, you still need to follow 
these guidelines, you know, physical distancing, facial coverage, especially when you're indoor uh, or in crowded places, even indoor, outdoor, and hand sanitization, staying home if you're sick, um, avoid unnecessary gathering, unnecessary traveling if you can. Uh, until this pandemic is over, we still have to follow these guidelines. Next slide, please. Uh, this one also comes up from time to time is that the vaccines were developed using fetal cells from uh, or embryonic cells from aborted fetuses. Um, the messenger RNA COVID vaccines are not created uh, and do not require the use of any fetal cell cultures in the production process. Um, now, some other vaccinations like the Johnson Johnson uh, and the Oxford uh, AstraZeneca vaccine did use uh, a cell line that is actually bioengineered. They're called HEK293. Now, these are not cells taken from aborted fetuses. These are bioengineered and uh, are used actually, ha or have been used for the past probably 15 years uh, as a part of the very initial uh, examination of uh, treatments and vaccinations. So it's kind of like a, a simulator, if you, if, for lack of better terms, like what, what will happen to the human cell if you uh, put this treatment or vaccine in it. And this is a core part of uh, research. Now, I, the name sounds confusing because HEK stands for human embryonic kidney cells. The, the, the name came from uh, early 1950s when uh, scientists did use uh, cells from an aborted fetus, but that practice is no longer in place. And that is like a long, long time ago. These cells are now bioengineered to last longer, to help us very in the very beginning to test if this substance treatment, vaccine, or any whatever we're trying to um, investigate will, will kill the cell, for example, before we go into animal trials and before we go into clinical trials with people. So not necessary uh, inside the vaccine, but it's used in part of the initial investigation. And again, these are not actually cells taken from aborted fetuses. These are bioengineered, basically lab cells. Uh, next slide, please. And these are some of the references. If you wanna look at any of the information that I mentioned, uh, the next slide is also references. And now uh, we can take questions now. All right, thank you so uh, much, Dr. Kusti and, and Claire for your um, knowledge and expertise here. So anybody that does have any questions, please feel free to either type them into the chat box um, down at the bottom, or um, please go ahead and unmute yourself um, if you would like to just uh, ask your questions that way, whatever your preference works for us. It's a very quiet group today. I think you have them all thinking. <laughs> all right, while everybody is thinking about the questions, if, if you have any, I'm going to- I have a question. Sure. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, Liz, I mean, to, I mean to cut you off there. That's okay, go right ahead. Um, so so I, was, I watched the commercial the other day about Johnson & Johnson. And the commercial said, um, it's talking about Johnson & Johnson and how the vaccine is coming back. And the, uh, the person said, um, why should you wait? <laughs> My thinking was, why should I wait? <laughs> what do you mean, why should I wait? Um, you just, Johnson & Johnson was had a pause and now it's coming back. Uh, that's cause to make me want to wait. But um, I also realized that um, that there is there is safety um, with them having a pause and then bringing it back. And uh, but anyway, I, I, before I go any further, uh, I'd like to hear your thoughts about that. And you know, now that Johnson uh, Johnson is Johnson is back, and folks are thinking out there um, like me, like, what do you mean? Why wait? <laughs> Well, I can I can start with that, Malcolm. So the as as mentioned, you know, these are very very rare. So for the Johnson and Johnson 
there were roughly uh, 8 million doses that, or 8 million people that were vaccinated and 15 uh, of them, of the 8 million have this rare uh, blood clotting disorder. And, you know, while we cannot confirm uh, a causation relationship, meaning that we can't confirm that the vaccine caused that, it has been reported and therefore uh, it is considered um, worthy to have a warning for people who are prone to have blood clots or have history of blood clots to just talk to their physician before they get the vaccine and see if that's the right for them. You know, every human being is different. And while, when there's options, you wanna discuss these options, but these are very rare. I mean, they, the disease itself is almost like in the literature, uh, um, very, very rare. And uh, it's probably a lot of, we don't know a lot about it in general. We've seen it with people reacting to heparin. So when people who are critical and they were in the hospital for major surgery and they were receiving heparin as a prophylaxis to prevent clots, they react, their immune system reacts to the heparin and produces this disease. And that's one of the reasons why the scientists are not sure why we're seeing that with uh, the, the vaccination, though it's, again, I repeat, it is extremely rare. Uh, it is something that we have to report as, um, you know, as scientists, we report everything. Now, when you put that in conjunction of other things we do or use on day to day, you know, every single medication, uh, whether it's over the counter or um, prescribed, has similar warnings, um, you know, simply as um, we, we probably, a lot of people take aspirin or Tylenol or ibuprofen uh, on a regular basis. If you actually spend time and read the warning, you'll see that they list a bunch of rare, uh, again, reactions and side effects. This is common. Anything that we put in our body, any chemical, any substance has the potential for some individuals to produce some rare um, side effects. It's just how we are built as humans. So yeah, I don't recommend that anybody waits because we do also on the flip side, know that if the person waits and gets COVID infection and not, and is not vaccinated, then their risk of dying is a lot higher. Uh, their risk of getting severe illness is a lot higher. The risk of getting long-term uh, effects lasting more than, you know, right now they're looking at people six months after getting and recovering from COVID-19 still having some uh, medical and health issues. And, you know, um, I don't want to say ironically, but these clots are also more common in people who get COVID than people who are getting it from the vaccine. They're a lot more common. And you saw a lot of people dying from COVID due to uh, blood clots developing in their system. So the disease itself is high risk for developing these blood clots. So again, we all in everything in medicine, whether it's surgery, whether it's treatment, whether it's chemotherapy, whether it's vaccination, you always weigh the risk versus the benefits. And the benefit of getting the vaccine um, severely outweighs the, the rare risks uh, that is associated with vaccination. Thank you. So since then, there has been a few questions that have popped um, in, into the chat here. So I'll go ahead and, and read through these. And Claire or uh, Dr. Kusti, if you want to take them, um, I'll defer to you guys. OK, so the first one is, what guidance do you have for employers who are getting resistance to returning to the office? The resistance is mostly fear-based. So you, you, for the most part, kind of have covered that through all the myths and, and things that we've already discussed. But is there anything else that you wanted to add there? I can start with that one. What we're recommending to employers right now is directing them to the guidance again from the CDC around best practices for you know, essential businesses and gatherings that have, do have to happen indoors. So, um, you know, I would recommend to those employers that are having resistance from your members and your populations to A, ensure that you are following all the appropriate guidance and recommendations. So hand sanitizing, uh, stations, if, if you have those resources available, certainly um, structuring your workspace so that you can promote social distancing, whether that's spreading out desks or cubicles, um, putting up 
physical barriers or shields to make sure that individuals in their workspaces are at least six feet apart from each other. And in enforcing and promoting uh, a policy and practice around both social distancing and utilizing um, masks and facial coverings. So I think A, uh, you know, confirming that you're in compliance with the most up-to-date recommendations and sharing that information that um, these are the guidance and recommendations that we have from, as Dr. Kutsi mentioned, these are published, studied, vetted by multiple independent organizations. And I think as long as you're in line with those practices, you can feel comfortable sharing that with employees to make sure that um, for those that, that do have to be physically back together or on site to accommodate your business needs, that everybody can be comfortable that you're doing it as safely as possible. Yeah, you know, well said, Claire. And I would add to that education. You know, a lot of people fear the unknown. If they don't understand um, how this disease works, if they don't understand the benefit of vaccination, if they don't understand the benefit of the guidelines that Claire was talking about, the physical distancing, the facial covering, good ventilation, all the things that are, are well documented and published to reduce the risk and mitigate the risk of uh, work, workplace outbreak, uh, people will be scared. But I think having that open conversation, having more educational materials being pushed out, uh, having open discussions. I've done a lot of uh, uh, live webcast webinars for employers that em the employees, the members were just coming uh, at a, a panel of us, including myself and uh, safety and HR. And we were just answering questions to address any concerns or any um, fears that people are having. And there's a lot out of there. I mean, I, we had an employer that saw about 10% resignation because they thought they were going to be forced to travel. Their, their job prior to COVID was to travel a lot. And they thought, if I go back, I'm going to get have to travel and I don't want to do that. So instead of having a conversation, they just, they just resign. Um, had they, you know, if there was better communication that, hey, we're not going to force anybody to do traveling, we're not going to force people and cram them in all in a conference room and make them, uh, you know, and violate the physical distance uh, guidelines, I think, um, you know, we, they, they would have seen probably less resignations and, and less people leaving the organization. So I think education plays a huge role in this. Thank you. So once you have um, the majority of your staff, everybody's been vaccinated, do, if somebody is exposed to COVID, do they still need to quarantine even if they've received the vaccination? The CDC had issued specific uh, guidelines for people who are vaccinated and exposed. So there's, there's a lot of, uh, I guess, um, relaxation, you know, of, of the requirement from the past. So. In, in certain situations, that individual may, if, if they're vaccinated and they were exposed, like they're identified in the uh, contact tracing process that they are a point of, of contact, they may not need to self-quarantine. So again, there, there is a benefit of, ha of being vaccinated that um, helps uh, employees and members stay at their work and not have to self-isolate. And these guidelines are available on the CDC website. Perfect, thank you. And then, so you have the vaccination, but you are still required to wear a mask when you're out in public around others. And is this to protect the others that you're around? Uh, yes, so it's, it's, again, as I mentioned, being vaccinated doesn't mean that I cannot transmit the disease. Again, this is based on the science we have now. This right. may change as we get more and more information, but uh, we, I could be vaccinated and because I'm vaccinated, I may not have symptoms of COVID. I may have the virus, but because my body is fighting it really well, I might not know. I may have a little bit of runny nose. I may think it's allergies, but then I go and interact with somebody who has poor immunity or taking medications, you know, that suppress their immune system and lower it. Uh, there are people that cannot get the vaccine because of medical conditions. It's contraindicated for them. Uh, there are people who, even if they're also vaccinated or not vaccinated, their immune system is just not as well developed and functioning as others. And therefore, I risk giving it to them uh, and then they could potentially die from it. So right now, until we get a 
huge number, and I said, and I mentioned 75 to 85% of the population, we should still follow the fa facial covering policy and physical distancing, um, at least until we know more about how well does the vaccine prevent uh, tra disease transmission. Perfect. Thank you. And then we have um, time for just one last question, and it's regarding uh, the booster. So do you have any information on um, if there will be a need for recurring booster shots? And if so, how often is, will that be necessary? That is still under, um, you know, certainly under research and development. At this point in time, no boosters are recommended or known, but on the flip side of that coin, we don't have long-term longevity studies to determine how long the effectiveness of the COVID vaccine will last. So uh, of those that were studied in the clinical trials and certainly real world evidence, we're continuing to research um, the extent of how long individuals will have protection or antibodies against COVID vaccine after uh, that the dose has been administered. So uh, a long answer for, we don't know at this point in time, Currently, there's no booster schedule, but it's something that may come up in the future as we see, um, you know, how long the effectiveness is maintained long term. Dr. Pusi, I don't know if you have any any other um, no, updates I, I, on that. But. I do agree with that. There's no scientific data to support how long this immune response will last after getting vaccinated. I am reading that some companies are potentially modifying their vaccines a little bit to adjust to the variants. But again, nothing has been published yet or formal. These are all uh, un, you know, uh, not really scientific resources that are producing these um, you know, talks about boosters. So we just have to wait and allow the science to, to do their thing and give science a chance and we'll have an answer to this, I'm hoping very soon. Perfect. Well, that wraps up. That basically brings us a little over here on time. So, so thank you so much, um, Claire and, and Dr. Kusti, for providing your knowledge and expertise to our members. And thank you, Malcolm, for um, providing us this opportunity uh, through the Pittsburgh Business Group on Health. Uh, at this time, I'm, I'm going to launch a quick poll uh, regarding today's program. Just please take a few moments to answer these questions. Uh, your feedback is very important to our planning committee as well as all of our speakers. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and post this. The session was approved for recertification credits. So the HRCI code for everybody is 558257. And the SHRM code is 21 dash D6 HPW. Um, so they are in the chat for you. Um, and they will also be emailed out to you at the end. And as I mentioned, we, we did record today's session as I know there's a lot of information that was presented. Um, and for me, that's, that's all I have. Malcolm, did you wanna say any last words? Well, again, thank you so much for having us, Liz. We do appreciate um, your time and thank you everyone for joining. Thank you, everybody. Have a great rest of your day. And some of the members, I'll probably see you later today at our open house, so or our virtual open house. So have a great day all and talk to you soon.